Hello, you are very welcome to this week's episode of the Group Chat Podcast from Virgin Media News. I'm political correspondent Gavin Riley, uh, joined in studio by news correspondent Zara King. Zara, hello. hello. How are you? And joined for our first global group chat uh, by him looming in the screen here over <laughs> us in studio, uh, news correspondent Richard Chambers. Richard, hello. Uh, welcome to the Group Chat, London Bureau. <laughs> um, I have the height of technology around me. Uh, a chair that's slightly too big for the desk, uh, so I'm sitting off the bed, and uh, I have a pillow sort of back against the lower back there, just for a little bit of lumbar support, so okay. I'm good to go for a long pod. I'm glad that Virgin Media Television has invested in all the ergonomic needs of, of a high-flying news correspondent. Uh, you might as well explain to us straight out the box what you're doing in London this week. Yes, well, this week Gav, I am examining the phenomenon known as London Grad or Moscow on Thames. And what that is basically is that the UK's own parliament has found this, um, is that London has basically become a laundromat for dirty money, for corruption, for money laundering by any other word, uh, by people from around the world, including oligarchs from Russia, who have invested a lot of money in property, um, in private jets, in super yachts, all of that sort of stuff in the city of London. And the whole point of the sanctions, which the EU, the US and the UK have done, is to target the oligarchs, the people who are billionaires and very close to Vladimir Putin, who have that influence over him, in the hope of ending the war. So there's a lot of money at stake here. A lot of the oligarchs who are close to Vladimir Putin have London as their base, their personal playground. Uh, and we have been looking over the course of the last couple of days um, at the whole phenomenon of it. If the sanctions are bringing it to an end, uh, what makes these oligarchs tick and meeting some of the people who have fallen foul of them and Vladimir Putin. So basically the principle is uh, upset Vladimir Putin's friends enough and he might consider stopping yeah, Which is an unusual way to go about international diplomacy. But you might as well explain, Richard, because even for, for those of us who follow this kind of full time, sometimes it can be very difficult to try and figure out how it is that targeting rich billionaires is actually going to influence the actions of a government that they're not part of. Yeah, I, it's a good question. And it, this this whole world is so murky that it is actually very difficult to sort of piece it all together sometimes. So for a long time, it has been known that Vladimir Putin, since assuming office in Russia uh, in the early 2000s, um, has had a number of billionaires who have been close to him, uh, many of whom have become wealthy off of the privatization of uh, state assets like natural resources, oil and gas, which we all know from Russia. They have made billions off this. They are known to be closely aligned to him politically, uh, that they are friends of his. I mean, the most famous example of a Russian oligarch, as the word is, these are a very small number of people, is Roman Abramovich. He is currently still the owner of Chelsea Football Club. He is an extraordinarily wealthy man. Uh, we were outside his gaff today in um, Kensington Palace Gardens, right beside William and Kate. He backs onto them. He effectively <laughs> lives in a 160 million euro mansion there. That's, that's his main pad. Um, Is it a nice place? Protected by armed. Oh my God, it's extraordinary. <laughs> um, myself and Oshin Moore and uh, my camera <clears throat> operator for, for, the, for this uh, little expedition, we were having a nose round. We wanted to see if we could get inside to Kensington Palace Gardens. Uh, and it's basically behind this big wall. And there's the Met Police are there with their submachine guns. They have private security at each of these mansions as well. So we couldn't get in. But you have to see these places to believe them. Like the, the, the Bramovich pad is like, 1,500 square metres, which is massive. This is one of the most expensive houses anywhere in the world. And he wants to expand it further by adding another swimming pool <laughs> and some staff quarters so that the people who are looking after him can cater for even more of his every needs. Wow. With, uh, well, at, at least William and Kate can't complain then about the quality of the neighbours. It's not like they're dragging down the property prices in the area. <laughs> so uh, at least there is that. Um, so, the neighbourhood. Uh, so, well, it, but it's, it's an interesting week then for you to be in London because this is the week then where you have a lot of these, these luxury assets which are supposed to be sort of frozen as part of all these sanctions somehow managing to escape the, the net until now. And, and literally, and these are incredible words to be using, somebody impounding a super yacht. Oh, wow. What is a super yacht? Where do you fit... Uh, a, a, a garage, a garage. <laughs> Get you, car hole chambers. <laughs> uh, On vacation, hon. It's literally a Simpsons joke. We've yeah. hit a Simpsons joke already here. <laughs> La di da, Mr. Frenchman. But um, yes, a super yacht, the fee or the phi, uh, depending on how your Greek pronunciation is, 
um, has been impounded. It has its own state-of-the-art wine cellar, uh, as well as a freshwater swimming pool, which is nice on a seafaring yacht. Um, but it's been impounded by the National Crime Agency here. Uh, that is the first time one of these has been seized in UK waters. We've had a number of other super yachts, which is just the ultimate toy for a billionaire Russian oligarch to have. Uh, they've been seized around the Mediterranean and in the US. But what's interesting is that the sanctions are having an impact in a very interesting way, not perhaps in the uh, sense that it's ending the war in any sense, but uh, Mikhail Friedman, who is one of the biggest Russian oligarchs who is living here uh, in a house called Athlone House, uh, just outside London, okay. uh, he says that, uh, <laughs> he says that the, the sanctions aren't fair. The sanctions aren't fair because he can't go out and get a taxi to a restaurant uh, and eat out. So he says it's outrageous that he is uh, sitting at home, eating at home, probably microwave uh, carbonaras for one like I would have. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, I, I, I doubt if he's sitting in that lone house having pot noodles for dinner, but like, so what? He can't do that because his bank accounts have been frozen because he's an oligarch and he's been tar targeted by sanctions. Is, is that it? Yes. So this is what we say when, when sanctions are in place. Your asset is frozen or it is seized. Roman Abramovich in Kensington Palace Gardens, for example, his gardeners can't get in there. His cleaners can't get in there and do the job. Chelsea Football Club, for example, the biggest asset that people will be familiar with mm. uh, of Roman Abramovich. They can't sell home tickets. They can't sell jerseys in the megastore. They are effectively uh, really sort of tied between being crown run by the UK government, Her Majesty's Chelsea FC, uh, <laughs> and being, you know, waiting to be sold off to whoever doesn't in fact buy them. But this is having an impact. And you already see Roman Abramovich sort of altering his longstanding position where he was denying being linked to Vladimir Putin. Now he is there in the Russian delegation in uh, Turkey in the peace talks. There's been a whole lot of secrecy and the accusations of suspected poisonings. But it is having an impact that he is becoming visible in terms of suing for peace now, at least visually in yeah. terms of actually turning out of the talks but it's very interesting to see that these these, these 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 oligarchs are having to change positions they've been dug into for many many years uh, because of all of this and but that's the question though isn't it is putin bothered by the discomfort of his rich friends well previously he hasn't been there is a cautionary tale and this is what observers of russia will always point to there was one russian oligarch back in the 2000s he was the richest man in Russia. Mikhail Khodorovsky is his name. He lives in London now as well. Um, but he fell foul of Vladimir Putin uh, and he ended up in jail for 10 years. Okay. So if you listen to investigative journalists like uh, Catherine Belton, uh, like Tom Burgess, uh, like Luke Harding at The Guardian, they will say that this was a message to the other oligarchs. Uh, Stay on side with me or all your stuff is mine, is wow. the message from Vladimir wow. Putin. But uh, it is extraordinary. It's an extraordinary world. So we'll have more on that as we go. But the people who do fall foul of Vladimir Putin, there is a real message to come from them. I think a lot of people who are listening to this will be aware of the story of Alexander or Sasha Litvinenko. Yeah. Uh, he is a former Russian spy uh, who fled Russia with his family, uh, Marina and their young son, Anatoly, uh, in the year 2000 because he basically saw, in his view, that Russia was becoming a mafia state. He saw Vladimir Putin, he met Vladimir Putin before, because Vladimir Putin was the head of the FSB, the intelligence agency, and he was like, this is going to go very badly for Russia and for the world. Uh, he fled, he had exposed massive corruption uh, and uh, organized crime links, and uh, he effectively was poisoned with polonium-210, which is a nuclear radioactive substance which had the potential to kill not just thousands, but millions of people in the city of London. There was a nuclear attack in the city of London in the year 2006. It was the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko, who died. People might remember the, fo the photo of him in his, his sick bed in hospital before he died. But Marina is pointing to his warning um, to the people of the world and to Vladimir Putin, saying, look, you can silence a voice but more people are going to keep on coming and speaking out about you and you won't be able to do this forever. But her point is that if the West had listened um, and all of this money and influence in London hadn't perhaps made it uncomfortable for the British government to speak out about their concerns about Vladimir Putin, that maybe the poisoning of Sergei Skripal, the initial invasion of eastern Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea, the invasion of South Ossetia in Georgia, that none of these things 
may have happened if those warnings were heeded. It's an extraordinary warning from the past. It was a warning that has been ignored. But I have a clip, actually, of Marina, who uh, okay. I spoke to yesterday, mm. just outside St. Paul's Cathedral um, in London. And it's so extraordinary for somebody who has, for 16 years, uh, been dogged in their pursuit of justice um, in their criticism of Vladimir Putin. She obviously still has friends and family in Russia. And they know what happened to Alexander Litvinenko. And she calls them up, and this is what happens. One example, uh, I decided to call uh, to my friend who is completely, uh, I would say, neutral, but nobody could be neutral now. Or you uh, agree people dying, or you disagree. This is not a neutral uh, situation. And when I just, okay, tried to call him to say, how are you? And he said, it's all fine. It's, but he was planning to come to London in May. And I just, again, very accurate, are you planning to come to London? Mm, maybe it would be changed. Again, no why, not try to discuss about this. And even him don't want to discuss with me. He knew Sasha. He visited us many times before Sasha was killed. What you could say about other people? I would say it is kind of a Stockholm syndrome, we can call this. Like all Russian people, almost 150 million population, they're hostages. Wow, that is... Yikes very revealing in terms of the thought process around this and basically mm. how cut off from reality a lot of people are in Russia. Well, this is what happens when you control every arm of the state. You've seen the last independent media organisations in Russia shut down, uh, newspapers, radio stations, television. Um, and the impact of this is just seen there, that people who knew Alexander Litvinenko they know what Marina Litvinenko has been through over the last 16 years. And they are like, yeah, nothing's bad happening in Russia at the moment. Everything is good. It might come out and see you in a couple of months. Wow. That's, it's it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy because they know, like they know from the personal experience of being friends with the family, they know what the Russian government is capable of if you get on the wrong side. And yet they're still they're just in total denial because they don't know any better about what's actually going on right now. And people uh, saw those photos of him deteriorating, didn't they, over yeah. time? I mean, that was, you know, headline news. You still think anyway. of that picture in your mind's eye where you can see yeah. him lying on, on the hospital bed sheets with the, the, all the blue stuff and then and he's so pale and gaunt and, and, and bald and everything. And just the guy was in an awful, awful shape. And can I just ask, Richard, how is she coping now? Obviously, it's been a long time since her husband died, but how are they holding together, particularly with all this? There's actually, that is a really good question, because obviously when she and Sasha and their son fled to the UK uh, in the year 2000, they had no English. Um, they arrived at Heathrow Airport and they had rehearsed what they would say to the first policeman they came across. Wow. And Sasha would say, I am a former KGB officer. I am here to seek asylum. And she sees a parallel with what's happening to people coming from Ukraine, to, UK, to the UK, to Ireland, to Poland, to other countries who arrive often not knowing the language. They are fleeing in many ways for the same reason that they fled. From Vladimir Putin, from the Russian government, and from, for fear of what might happen to them. Uh, she says she is physically sick when she thinks about this because it is her situation. Uh, multiplied by millions. There's four million people who have fled Ukraine now at this point. Mm -hmm. So imagine that, just watching that every single day on the news. And she is adamant that we don't look away from what's happening on the news as well. She understands that things move on and she's seen that to her own detriment so many times. But she has seen her situation played out more than four million times already. Uh, and she says she feels physically sick every time she sees it. You can totally imagine why. Um, 15 or 16,000 of those people at the time of recording have already come to Ireland. But just before we talk about how the Irish government is going to deal with that, Richie, you've also been talking to someone who, in the more modern day, has been described as Vladimir Putin's number one enemy. And he has some thoughts about <coughs> Ireland's role in allowing some of the money and funds and assets of oligarchs to come sloshing around here. Yeah, this is fascinating, guys. My name's Bill Browder. A lot of people might have read his book, uh, Red Notice. It was the New York Times bestseller. But he was a big investor in Russia. He's an American, British citizen. He moved to Russia. He spent many years there, spent loads of money, made loads of money there, fell foul of, fell foul of the oligarchs and Putin for exposing corruption. Um, he's basically been a marked man ever since. Uh, Vladimir Putin has put him on the Interpol most wanted list many, many times. Uh, he is absolutely wanted dead by Russian authorities. Um, he says, and he has raised this with the Guardian as well, 
um, that there is every possibility and he, uh, every likelihood that there is dark money, as I say, money being laundered through Ireland. Uh, and that is a great concern. And there are other Irish links to this as well, because um, one oligarch whose house I actually visited outside today, uh, Oleg Deripaska, he is the part owner of the parent company of Oganish Illumina, the, um, ah. the, the, the plant in, in, in County Limerick. Uh, he denies that this is his house. He says it belongs to his family. But protesters occupied that house because they wanted it to be turned over to Ukrainian refugees, because that's an interesting split between Ireland and the UK in terms of the number of people who have arrived <clears throat> into Ireland so far mm. is actually directly comparable to the amount of visas that have been given by the UK government, which is paltry when you compare it to the size of the relative countries. Yeah. And I just think that is something which is very interesting, that you are having that backlash on the ground by people who have seen their city being used in many ways by the oligarchs and they want to say right that's 60 million euro house that should house many mm. Ukrainian families and how are you finding filming this story has there been any sort of challenges I mean how do people feel about you working on this are you coming up against it a little bit <laughs> funnily enough yeah <laughs> people don't like you filming outside their super houses do you know what I mean yeah, so, yeah. Um, we had a bit of a can they afford the security a, guards a, a, anymore though <laughs> Yeah, this is the thing. I was wondering. It's like, <laughs> clearly, like, I mean, if you can't pay these guys, why are they still doing it? So maybe there's some way of doing that. I don't know. But, um, yeah, we had um, an exchange of words, an exchange of views uh, with one man who didn't take kindly to us uh, filming outside uh, one property which has been hit by sanctions by the UK government. So our explanation was, here, this is obviously newsworthy. The UK mm -hmm. government thinks it's newsworthy. Uh, can we film here? And he was like, no, get away, get away, even though it's on a public road. So, um, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's an interesting story. It's something, it, I, I must commend my um, my camera colleague uh, Oshin Moran for yeah. holding his nerve in those. Oh, it's moments. great under pressure, our Oshin. Uh, Gav, what's Ireland doing about all of this? Oh, I, just, I can't wait to see that footage because I'm sure we will get to see that at some <laughs> other point. And and no better man than Oshin to stand his ground as well 100%. and fair play to him. Um, how Ireland is dealing with all of this, like Richard, you, you make a very good point about the contrast between the number of people that the UK is taking in relative to the size of the country versus what Ireland is doing. Um, at the time of recording, around 16,000 people have come from Ukraine um, to Ireland. Around half of them, or over half of them, are seeking government help in housing. So there's obviously some people who have come and are able to stay with connections, but the government is trying to house some of those people. They're now beginning to work through the pledges of accommodation. Um, but uh, on Wednesday of this week, we had it put in very, very clear terms, possibly the clearest so far, um, from Roderick Gorman, who's the Minister for Integration. So he's responsible for trying to find some long-term sustainable housing for them. And he was making the point that, yeah, we're going to roll out all the hotel rooms we can. We're going to talk to religious orders about seeing if there are old convent style accommodation that they might have or monasteries which aren't being used and bring them back online and have them ready for people to use. We're going to talk to basically anyone who's got anything at all. And we know for a fact that very, very quickly, all of that accommodation and all of the offers we've got are not going to be enough to deal with what we need. This is the greatest humanitarian crisis Ireland has ever faced. More than 15,000 people have fled here in just over a month, with more than half of those now accommodated by the state. This response will get more challenging in the weeks and months ahead. The accommodation available through local authorities, religious organisations, state bodies and pledged accommodation is unlikely to meet the level of need should the higher estimated numbers of people arriving come to pass in the weeks ahead. Current modelling suggests that there is an, an inevitability to moving into an, an emergency accommodation phase when pledged and other service supply is exhausted. The only question is how quickly this phase is reached. Wow. So the only question is how quickly we run out of places that we can sustainably house. But when we run out of places, what actually happens? Well, then this is where like the real rubber meets the road because there, there's a separate question about you know how are you going to just manufacture? There's already of course a shortage of housing for for those who've already lived here anyway. Let alone possibly a six-figure number of people coming in. Um, on a short-term basis, they're going to be renting out some of the convention centres, concert halls, like the the Green Glens Arena in Mill Street, where the 1993 Eurovision Song Contest was held okay. is now going to be just converted into basically dormitory style accommodation like like almost like and not to go back to the Simpsons again but Simpsons military school like secondary school bunks sort of a thing so this is like the temporary refugee camps I saw on the border 
Yeah, li- like that, so but in Ireland and, and quite likely maybe all over Europe because this is just the sheer volume of what we're going to have and nowhere has an abundance of housing that you can use. So uh, the Greenlands Arena, probably going back to City West again, some of the, the field hospital setup that was there a couple of years ago, likely then to be revived for uh, for the, the arriving refugees. Um, even some of the, the army uh, camps like Gormanston in County Meath, where they're going to be rolling out the bunk beds again and having people sleep there. And the, the initial goal is that if they don't have a hotel room to put you in on the day that you come originally they would hope that only then would they have to send you to the likes of a Gormanston just to give you some shelter for the night while they find somewhere else to, to put you up but that's going to be the, the full time solution for, for some people that if you're coming with young children or elderly or infirm parents it's hardly going to be the ideal thing and it's like you saw you said yourself Zara the you know the the converted supermarkets on the border yeah that's the style of sleeping that a lot of people are going to be looking at and I think as well like that was okay in a short term you know what I mean as in that was okay I guess when you were just trying to get people to safety mm-hmm. whereas the fact that now that's all we will have for when we're planning yeah I think that's quite different actually and, but, and it's real any port in a storm stuff mm. and this is why the government's talking about having to suspend planning laws so that it can basically if there is a, a good open site, some public park somewhere that it can throw up some uh, modular housing, the, the prefab stuff, which was the great panacea a couple of years ago, which didn't turn out to be quite as good as everyone hoped it might be. But they will literally do anything to try and put up this many people because they're going to have to. Dara Bryan, the housing minister, says we might need to find, on top of what we were already doing and what we already needed to address the housing shortage in Ireland, on top of that, you're going to need about another 33 to 35,000 homes, which is a whole year's worth of building on top of everything else that you're doing you will have to rush forward because there is no other option but to house these people. And a lot of this is also based on time, Short isn't it? Number. Because, you know, we don't mm. know when the war will end. And also we don't know what will be left when people want to go home. I suppose mm. it is important to remember that every person you meet who comes here from Ukraine kind of wants to go home eventually. Yeah. None of them want to end up living in one of these sort of setups. But the reality is they just don't know the time frame on that. Yeah. There's just no, there's and, no way And we telling. just don't know how long they're going to be or how much longer the war may go on or how much more devastating it could be. Obviously, some talk about Russia scaling it back, leaving out some of the, the major cities and trying to concentrate on the, the eastern regions where we all thought it might be mm. before it ever kicked off. Um, but like we've said before, you could have a situation where if the battle does not go their way, the fathers who stayed behind to be conscripted, leaving to go and follow their wives and children and parents across the continent and then even accommodation then that was appropriate may no longer be appropriate because then you've got another another man or two, two men in the house who need to come home and you need to find somewhere else for them. It's just going to be an enormous Enormous challenge. Enormous challenge. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I wish I could say on a happier note. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> it's not necessarily a happier note, but obviously there's been a lot of concern this week again and a lot of talk about COVID-19 case numbers mm. and whether some measures might be advised so as to try and take the wind out of the sails of this latest wave. Zara, you were reporting earlier in the week about there being new calls for the government to do... Something. Something. So, literally something, anything but about where we are. No thing, so welcome to living with COVID, everyone. We want, it, but is, you wanted to make your own decisions. Congratulations, we're making our own decisions. So is it, talk, us, then, talk us through the group then, which which is looking for yeah. there to be something. Well, so uh, there, yeah. So the ED task force, obviously, you know, they're looking at the situation in hospitals up and down the country. Enormous pressure there, and they're saying, look, we're under massive pressure. We have up to six thousand uh, healthcare workers now absent, or frontline workers, or HC workers out due to COVID. Six thousand, six thousand, which is huge, like enormous. So huge. It's when you put, huge. When you put it into context, like, that is an extraordinary. Yeah. Number. Like that's a that's a town's worth. Like, wasn't it, but wasn't like, it's it 3,000 like, back in January? Like, it, I don't it, know, it it's effectively, like, if you're just trying to think of the, what the HSE employment numbers, it's basically like 4% of the entire mm-hmm. HSE workforce across all divisions. So any 25 people who work in any unit, and, and we, you've, you've reported extensively before about, mm-hmm. for example, how many people have to staff an ICU bed. Yeah. That you just can't afford to lose 4% of the, of the workforce. No, and even like you can hear there's examples of whole teams being out. So you might have like a whole team working in one division in the hospital that all potentially got it from one another and they're all out so you've got whole teams out particularly concerns around uh, the impacts of having on mental health services because you have uh, staff and mental health services out due to COVID as well so look it's having an enormous impact across the board uh, the likes of the INMO had been calling for a temporary um, reintroduction of the mask mandate mm. but it's not happening no um, it's not happening because, expire. well this is it because people are at the very earliest people are going to be listening to this podcast on a Thursday morning and mm. as of midnight tonight then midnight Thursday night um, the government turns back into a pumpkin basically <laughs> that all of the the emergency powers that they've had for the last two years to allow you be locked in your house and only go two kilometres or to wear a mask in the shop yeah. or to have no more than six visitors to your home or whatever else. Gone. All those powers 
Done. Would completely lose their legal backing. Close which down. means that, so even if you wanted a new mask mandate or if you thought that it was a, a, a low octane, low invasive way of taking the heat out of the figures, mm. You just can't do it. You can't now, do it. Now here's this doesn't exist. You can't. You haven't got the framework to put. All right, here you go. Snap your fingers, and from tomorrow, yeah. you're all wearing masks again. That's just not. That's just not there. No, mm. so, so now the strategy seems to be to appeal to people's better nature and to ask people politely, "Would you mind terribly wearing your mask in a crowded setting?" But, but, which is what the advice has been for two months already. Well, it has. But I suppose yeah. they're sort of further, you know, yeah. maybe going a bit. You know, Colin Henry from the HC was on with us during the week, and he was sort of saying, "You know, would you mind terribly putting your mask on in a crowded setting in a more sort of, you know, mm. please definitely do that uh, sort of way." But I just want to say as well, it's interesting to look at the numbers because, you know, we were talking last week about how the Thornista had said, you know, looking at Denmark as the great white hope and saying yeah. Denmark are kind of over the hill already mm. I wonder are we nearly I don't want to say it too soon are we kind of coming over the hill because obviously last Tuesday we had kind of 23 and a half thousand yesterday or you know earlier this week I kind of had 14,000 we're down to the kind of 12,000 mark now mm. dare I say it is it possible that we've hit the peak of BA2 and we're coming down the hill I'm not sure I mean it's a bit too early to probably yeah. say that but well, very possible well, in fairness I suppose um Particularly uh, Richard, because you know you literally wrote the book and all of this. So um, yeah. the there's a plug um, <laughs> that the, there's State there's a danger that, that, that available. people see. You know, we were saying last week that some people see COVID as a health problem and some people see COVID as just a yeah. threat to your freedom to do stuff. Yeah. But then there's also the the you know the broader public might think that COVID is a bit of a mild dose and nothing much to worry about. But if you're responsible for running hospitals and you can't afford to fly on one wing without six thousand people missing, you can understand how there's slightly different perceptions to things. Yeah, totally. And like, I mean, just the impact of it is extraordinarily difficult at the moment. And it isn't just even in terms of staff uh, at the moment in hospitals. You are seeing real impact in terms of beds in particular units. And Zara, you'll know all about this as well. Like, there is a huge proportion of the current patients in hospital in units right across the country who are actually COVID patients now at this point. Mm. Um, and it's very difficult to work when that is the case, when the isolation requirements are there, when you are trying to stop the spread of it in hospitals. And that has proven very, very difficult to do at some of the lowest points of this pandemic in this country. When you are down staff, it also then becomes harder to contain it when it is spreading in hospitals. Um, and this has been passed right up the chain in terms of how people in the HSE and the health service are looking at it and they are concerned. But also, in the space of the last week since we released our last episode, um, the guy ultimately who has been the public face of the COVID-19 response mm. Uh, mm. has announced that he will no longer be the chief medical officer, Dr. To Tony Houlihan. Um, what was your reaction when you saw this? Were you surprised that he was going away from the job? I mean, he's 21 years in the Department of Health, 14 years as the CMO, a lot of stuff has happened there. There's a lot of water under the bridge, uh, not mm -hmm. just even yeah. relating to the last two years of COVID. You had, you had a previous pandemic, the swine flu pandemic. You have the cervical check situation. That's something which we're likely to hear more about in yeah. the future he as had, well. He had original There's SARS. Issues around yeah. yeah. Minimum unit. He was. And this is how he first met Michal Martin, was over uh, SARS. Michal Martin was the, uh, the Minister for Health at that time. These guys know each other a long, long way. Mm. But when you think about how far ago, away ago that was in the past, that's how long this guy was in a leadership role in the Department of Health. You were shaking your head there, Zara, when Richard I asked if we were surprised. surprised. Yeah, I wasn't surprised, actually. I don't know why I wasn't oh. surprised. Well, I just wasn't surprised because I feel like, I suppose, you get to that point in your career as well in a job like that, and I suppose you go through mm -hmm. what what uh, Tony Hulin and colleagues in the Department of Health that he's had have been through in the last two years, and I, I kind of expected it, I suppose, really. Not mm. that anyone had told me or anything. I just sort of felt that you could see probably, if we're all honest, over the last couple of months that like maybe there was kind of a, you know, a winding down almost there, I think, you know, yeah. possibly, that he had sort oh, of yeah, done, sure. done the job and done an enormous job in terms of leading the country through that response over the last uh, two years and uh, I think you know it seems sort of like a, a good time maybe yeah as a, you know why stay on maybe any longer well, you, you can definitely imagine like in any job if you've been yeah. doing any job and, and he's basically like you said Richard he's basically doing it for two decades because he was deputy CMO for seven years and then yeah. he was full CMO for 14 and if you have something as all encompassing which just occupies your pretty much every waking moment for so much of the last uh, 27 months ever since the, the dinner that he had in Dillinger is described on page one of your book Richard <laughs> um, that if it's been if it's occupying your, your tunes, nice beer. there we go emergency available in all good bookshops <laughs> Um, <laughs> that if, if it's occupying your every thought you can kind of imagine how a time comes where well actually if you get over yeah. that enormous challenge that you just yeah. kind of find it very difficult almost to get motivated by the rest of it because the stakes have been so high that what's really going to get your mojo going again you know yeah I think no, so totally. I mean this was a guy like this is a guy sorry Zara 
But this is a guy who literally had calls on Zoom with his key leadership team on Christmas Day uh, in 2020 leading into 2021. This was all consuming for him. Um, he, his family will be very aware of the cost that he, he, he spoke about this with me uh, when I sat down with an interview from the book, but like his family felt the impact of that. His last months with his whole family together, including his wife, uh, who then of course sadly died, they were dominated by COVID-19. Uh, mm. That is an enormous personal toll to be put on anyone. But also, as you're sort of saying, Gab, if you have this all consuming you for such a long period of time, like what Tony Hulin is moving on from his job, we've talked about this before, in across the health service, Tony Hulin just happens to be the most senior doctor in the country. There are doctors, there are nurses, there are HCAs, there are porters, there mm. are caterers, yeah. there are people across the hospital system who are looking at their futures in the healthcare system uh, post-COVID, and they are considering their future, many of them, are heading for the exit door and they are going to emigrate from this country. Yeah, I would echo that. I spoke to somebody in the health service there this week as well who said the exact same thing. We were just chatting about the CMO finishing mm. up and saying, you know, were you surprised and, and whatnot? And uh, that person said, no, not at all. I've seen loads of people leaving the health service. So I think it's been a very, you know, bruising and difficult two years for people working in that sector. And yeah. it's no surprise that people will be looking for a fresh and new challenge. Um, speaking of uh, people or groups that have had a difficult couple of years, uh, and it's sort of ongoing as well because of some of the stuff they've had to do this week. Um, Zara, you were uh, on the trail of Charles and Camilla yes. uh, last week, which is where, of course, you got your Capri Sun. Where I got my Capri Sun. Yeah. I was, yes. Yeah, so they visited Waterford, my home county. The Royal Capri Sun. <laughs> loves me county. <laughs> the Royal Capri Sun. In you can't the, say you love your county without doing the full Milan accent. Do you know what? I actually met John Milan last week on Friday. I really wanted to say it to his face, but then I got too nervous. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's actually, if, if he was there, they really should have introduced him to the couple and made him tell them that he loves his county. Oh, really? Yeah, so he was with I actually nice met him at a book lunch. And Camilla to meet some royalty for a change rather than the other way around. There you go. Yeah. Well, they did meet royalty. They met Rachel Blackmore, actually. She's the, oh, fair. She's okay. the queen of racing. Oh, yeah. 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 Camilla met Rachel Blackmore, actually, at Henry de Bromheads on Thursday. The weather was magnificent for the royal visit, I'm mm. going to say. Very proud of the southeast, the sunny southeast, Waterford and Tipperary, both looking magnificent over the two days. Look, you know what? The royal visit is great in terms of uh, great pictures of Ireland being beamed across the yeah. world. Let's be honest. Like, that is absolutely magnificent. Yeah. And so, like, some, we, we sort of un understate that, and we go, yeah. nah, not well, really. I think I, did I say that to you last week I didn't think there'd be huge interest in it yeah. like oh it'd be a bit low key or whatever I wouldn't say there'd be that many journeys yeah. I couldn't get over when I went into the press centre on the Thursday morning I was absolutely stunned it was wedged loads of them there is an amazing cottage industry of people who, yeah. who don't even necessarily mm. work for like major media outlets or major yeah. publications but they are basically just like freelance royal followers who make yeah. a living royal by just offering themselves yeah. out as, as talking yeah. heads or freelancers around the world like it's an extraordinary little cottage I industry I saw a clip the other day actually of one of these people who was a royal commentator Later. He's given out to think about Harry and Meghan, I think, or something again. There's a, a, <laughs> a, tendency, a, a tendency of some people in that particular line of employment. But it is so fascinating that there is just this, you know, this, this caravan of people who follow, you know, royalty around the world and yeah. just go wherever they go. And they like, obviously, there's a huge cultural interest in that as well, and that they're going to places and they have to explain to people around the world why it's interesting that he's in Waterford, why it's interesting that he's in Tipperary and what, mm. the, what, the, what the resonance and all that is. It is a fascinating gig. It is. Do you know who was on it, actually? It's you know Arthur Edwards, the royal photographer. Are you familiar with him? Do I know the name? Yeah, you would know him, definitely. Yeah. He's been photographing the royals since, you know, uh, Harry and William were really small. He would, have, he would have photographed Diana a lot over the years. Okay. He would be kind of like the famous photographer in the press pack mm. that everyone sort of wants to chat to and, and hear all his stories. I mean, he's he's travelled all over the world with them. So, yeah, no, it was really, um, look, I think in terms of showcasing Ireland, it was, it was good for the country. Yeah. What was actually quite nice and totally unexpected on the Friday in Tipperary was that uh, Charles and Camilla met met with Ashling Murphy's family and that was something, oh, wow. that was something yeah. they had personally requested actually so it wasn't um, you know put on the agenda or something that they yeah. sort of had to do it, it wasn't some, some handler in the no. embassy who thought this would be a nice thing to yeah. do but they, they actively went and sold them out yeah so I was told apparently that the royal couple were really touched by the outpouring of you know love and grief for, um, for Ashling Murphy at that time particularly in the UK I suppose a lot of people you know were, were looking at it in the context of Sarah Everett only after happening in mm. recent months as well and um, for that reason the Royal Couple were really keen to sort of meet uh, Ashling's family, pay their respects and 
and uh, pay tribute to her. And so uh, Prince Charles mentioned her in his uh, final speech and said that uh, she would never be forgotten. So it was actually quite a nice touch, I thought, on the last day, particularly mm. because it had been a personal request from them. Yeah. And the photograph was released then afterwards. So, so they've now blocked off 13 counties, I think, of, yeah. the, of the 26. They'll so they'll, they'll be back. <laughs> they'll uh, be back. I, I presume, like Richard, at this point, we sort of have to make the case that, like, you know, Meath and Claire are awaiting if they do want to you know, use them as their next big uh, <laughs> tourist hotspot. Uh, other counties are available, but, with all the royal but, but they're not nearly yeah, they're as not nice. They're not worth uh, it. Come, come, to, come to our counties, please. Um, there's w- one other very significant story before we sort of get to our, our sort of AOB. Yeah. Um, and it's another story which, um, at the time, because it's, it's frightening to think, is it 10 years since? It's 11 years. 11 years 11 since years. The, the extraordinary and shocking murder of Michaela McAreevy in Mauritius. And it was a story which completely gripped the country at the time. Everyone remembers the trial of the hotel workers who were ultimately acquitted of her murder. Yeah. And it's a story which seemed to have gone cold. And then uh, today, as we're recording this on Wednesday, the end of the evening's hour, today, suddenly, at, almost out of the blue, another arrest and the story blown wide open again. Yes, yeah, so Dasan Narayna is actually a security worker who worked at the Legends Hotel at the time who was arrested initially uh, back at the beginning of all this and then he was subsequently uh, released and charges were all dropped in 2013 um, and then out of nowhere in the last couple of days uh, he was arrested again. So we were speaking today to uh, Vikash Tiluk Dari, who is his barrister um, about this and saying, you know, wh- why has your client been arrested? What exactly is this new uh, developing information? And his point is that actually they can't see any evidence of any uh, new and developing information. He's actually saying that this is nonsense, there's nothing new. He says his client uh, continues to maintain his innocence. Now, uh, Dassin would have um, had his DNA detected on the key card, which was used to access the room okay. uh, in which Michaela was was murdered. Um, that was the link in the beginning to all of this. But as I say, he was arrested. Um, he was taken into custody. There was another, there was an incident where he was he was ill. He ended up in hospital and back to court. There was a couple of back and forth. Okay. Basically, his barrister saying that uh, he questions how this case is actually being handled. In fact, he actually pointed to today um, a theory that he had said that the family, Dassin's family, had been approached by police and this is what they were told. He told me that before my arrival, one police officer of that team called him from the sitting area, called him outside to have a little chat with him. And the proposition that was made, look, your family are in poverty, you don't even have a house, you don't even work properly, you rely on this, that. Here we have one million rupees, this is what was told to him, but provided that he cooperates with police. So he's basically saying, right, co- cooperate with us, but here is some money to secure your cooperation. Yeah, so it's a million rupees. So it's about 20,000 euro. It's, it's a bit of an unorthodox way to go about a prosecution, isn't it? Well, I should say allegedly, allegedly. This okay. is what the barrister well, is yeah. saying, is that the, mm. the, he's alleging that the police have said this to the family. So look, um, there seems to be a lot, of, a lot going on there. I suppose, look, just to point as well to the fact that there was um, a documentary made by Virgin Media, then TV3, back in 2012. Our mm. colleagues, Kira Doherty and Ronan McIntyre were in Mauritius. And they actually went to the home of Das and Narayana at that time and Kira sat down with him and interviewed him about the whole thing and he spoke at that time about the fact that he had a gun put to his head he says and he was asked to sign a statement. Okay let me have a listen to that then. They asked me to sit down. I am frightened I was crying. They shouted and screamed at me. Then a man came to me who was well dressed. I don't know him. He came bizarrely towards me and placed his right leg on the table. He removed a revolver from his sock. He emptied the magazine and filled them back. He asked me if I'd been hit by this. I was crying and replying back to him, no sir. He asked me to do whatever I was told or else. I will kill by pointing the gun at my head. I was frightened and crying. I thought he would kill me. Then he left the place and an officer asked me if I will sign the statement. They wrote it and I signed it. So look, I suppose in summary what's happening right now is he's actually been uh, charged with larceny today. So he's basically been charged with uh, conspiring to steal a hotel room keycard. So, uh, yeah, so it's hard to know where this investigation is really going, to be honest. Um, When I asked his barrister about why did he think this was happening right now, why this timing, he seemed to believe that it was something to do with maybe psychologically toying with his client, that, you know, when the time when he'd had the charges dropped, it was in March and here we are in March again. He sort of seemed to suggest that there was some sort of... um, 
maybe toying with him or, or manipulation. Again, this case is obviously, you know, at the centre of this at the end of the day is the Hart and McGreevy families. No one has ever mm. uh, been convicted for the murder of Michaela McGreevy and we really cannot forget that. John McGreevy said in a brief statement today that he was keen, being kept abreast of the uh, situation in Mauritius but he didn't want to comment further at this time. Yeah, there's a family that are, that are still grieving and until they get some kind of justice it's going to be very difficult for them ever to uh, to try and uh, close this chapter and of course they'll always live with the memory of Michaela in, in her life and of course in, in the way that she died. Um, a um, couple of other stories to um, kind of wrap up the week, and, and we'll, we'll talk about the Oscar slap in a minute uh, because you know we all need to to prepare our, our steaming hot have... takes. Richard is literally <laughs> rubbing his hands if you're not watching this, ready for his his can't Chris wait. Rock take. Can't wait to hear. Him. Um, I'm going to slam everyone else's take. The, the <laughs> please don't slam everyone's take. Lots takes. of takes. Of the um, the leaving cert overhaul. It seems like the sort of story that that and maybe it will be talked about more but uh, in in future months because you know the way that the, the media always seems to coalesce around the leaving search when it comes to early june and no doubt when we get to early june we'll be talking about it on this podcast as well but like an overhaul of the leaving search seems to have been such a a massive massive like generations in the making thing and then richard i don't know if it seems to you or th- like it does to me that it just kind of slipped out there without getting the big pizzazz that you might have thought it would get otherwise no, and there was no build-up really either. Like, with any other changes, even during COVID of the leaving cert, there was a little breadcrumb trail to bring it up to that point. Whereas now they just dropped this, and I was just like, I saw it on my phone earlier on, and I was like, oh, didn't didn't see this coming. This is <laughs> this is sizable. This will this will change people's yeah. perspectives of their school lives. But so yeah. Yeah, we will talk about it in more and more time. But the, so the idea behind this is that they're going to restructure every single subject so that forty percent of your grade is already done before you go in to do the written exams at the end. Mm. So it's a little bit like what's basically happened with colleges over the last ten or fifteen years, where instead of it all being the finals that you do at the very end, it's a little drip feeds along the way. The idea is to take less pressure uh, off pupils, which of course is, is great great as long as it doesn't add to more pressure along the way because I remember being around UCD when that whole process came in where they replaced the end of year finals Richard you're probably just you're probably in that that first generation because you were a couple of years behind me in UCD and you'd probably of that generation where suddenly everything was semesterized and you had continuous assessment the whole way along the way and it, it seemed to take a lot of the scope that you had for know, crack I don't know. I, you're, you're playing a dangerous game asking me about college exams and asking me <laughs> uh, whether or not I sat all of the ones that I was meant to sit and what not so okay um, touche right well maybe then we'll, <laughs> we'll put that one away listen we, we hope that it works because like, just uh, there may be some some listeners who are um who, who are going through their leaving right now or who are looking at doing their leaving in a couple of years and don't generally know now what sort of format it's going to be and they hope that it's going to be a nicer one and they hope that the new subjects like sustainable development and drama and theater are great so we hope that they they get a bit of clarity on, on what's going on soon because there's some good stuff in there but there's still a lot to work out um the oscar slap now that we gave you a couple of minutes to prepare your prepare hot runners. takes yeah well so i asked people on instagram today what they thought of the oscar slap so the question was uh, did you think will was right was wrong what were your thoughts on it so gonna what are the Richard, takes <laughs> <Richard>. <laughs> I, I know i know i <laughs> feel that dangerous. for you i love that for you yeah. okay uh, hillary says i think he was wrong but was definitely provoked chris rock should be ashamed of himself um neve says shouldn't have reacted like that so violent other ways to deal with things um i'm gonna just i'm gonna scroll through so we can get a bit mm. of writing on it i don't blame him for being angry slash upset but i think hitting was a step too far says helen Uh, David says, violence is never right. Geraldine says, I'd be appalled if my husband used his love for me as an excuse for being violent. Um, It is an interesting take. It is. Because there's a lot of people on on day one who would have gone, oh, fair, like your your initial, the the hottest of hot takes would be, fair play to you for standing up now for your wife's honour. So I would would say, yeah, Yeah. I would say like I changed my mind within moments. I think my initial reaction was like, oh, he obviously loves her so much. This is like, you know, very chivalrous. But within minutes, I was like, (laughs) within minutes, I was like, (laughs) Actually, you can't just hit people yeah. <laughs> because you love someone. So, um, but I can understand that, like the initial sort of look. She was very upset, obviously, and um, you know nobody wants to see their their mm. wife upset like that. But it's not okay. To yeah, people. there's, there's other ways do to do it. You can't. And he was quite angry, I thought, afterwards, wasn't he? Did you see he was like fuming afterwards this as well? Is my thing, Zara. Yeah. Like if you boil this down to its bare parts, if you told me a day before the Oscars that somebody is going to walk up on stage and slap a presenter. Can you? And he's going to then walk back <laughs> down to the front row, sit down again, and shout up again twice, uninterrupted, very loudly, very awkwardly, and that he wouldn't be thrown out of the place. 
and then a few minutes later then he's given the best actor award but you couldn't throw him out when they were giving Absolutely. him the award like what were you well, this do? is like, it you know? but, like, I mean, but this is what a lot of people who are there are saying well maybe he should have been that he should have been thrown out it's I, I don't know if there's any right answers on this I do think that um, walking up and slapping someone on stage at the Oscars is probably not the best option that is presented to anyone at <laughs> yeah. any well, put it, moment and time. Yeah, like put it this way, like, you know, say if there was a local GA Sports Awards, Ron, right? Let's just bring it back to a local level. <laughs> okay. Okay? Right, okay. And this happens. <laughs> and the you MC, I mean? and you've asked Sarah King to MC your, your club awards. player goes yeah. up and like slaps the head off the local radio presenter because, you know, like, I mean, so, like if you bring it back to local mm. level, is it because, like, you know, Will is the fresh prince of Bel Air to all of us and he's always sort of had, let's be honest, a lovely sort of warm, kind yeah. reputation. That like his, his whole persona for basically yeah. four decades has yeah. been I am sound and funny and nice. Yeah. And then he for that to happen. He that guy once. Do you remember it? Um, it was a red carpet thing. I think it was actually in Moscow. Um, and there was a, a fake reporter who went to kiss him and he slapped oh. him in the face. I have no recollection of that. I know that. Okay. No. Google it, kids. Richard Chambers Cheers. never forgets. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Chambers is, is the, the Google Every of the YouTube East. YouTube playlist of best celebrity slaps. I, I actually, like, obviously there's, there's no defending the, the way that, that he behaved or, like, the, the snap impulse. But I actually, I'm just, I'm actually gutted for him that the night which should be known yeah. now forever as, like, the crowning glory of his acting career. Because, like, I don't forget how long ago he played Muhammad Ali in the movie but I remember there being like Oscar buzz around that the people were like this is an extraordinary performance by him so there's been talk of him being there or thereabouts for best Oscar for maybe the guts of 15 or 20 years and it's finally the time that he managed to make it to the top of the mountain and when he goes to give his speech he's basically there crying because he's flipped out at someone and knows that he's done wrong 10 or 15 minutes earlier but I thought his award but it's also overshadowed, and this is actually almost lost in it. It's overshadowed every other yeah. award there as well. Yeah. Agree, yeah. Anybody else who was looking to find out who won the Oscars last night no- or the other night, yeah. it took a while to find out who won the awards. Yeah, no, but you, you were saying that it took you a while to find out that he actually won Best Oscar himself because of how the slap dominated the yeah, coverage. Yeah, I didn't know either, actually. I was stunned. I just saw that he slapped uh, Chris Rock on stage. I did not realize that. I, I was just like, like, I dropped my phone when I found But I thought that it wasn't after. real. Yeah, Remember I said that to you? Yes. Yeah, so, so you were saying that the, and maybe this is a, a sign of the, the era of misinformation yeah. and disinformation that we're in, that you saw it and you didn't believe that it was a natural, spontaneous no, thing at all. I didn't at all. I actually looked at it. Remember I texted you guys and I was like, oh, yeah. I think that's been a stage performance. So cynical for one so young. I know. I honestly did think it was sort of like a, a performance or whatever. But um, yeah, I didn't believe it initially. There is a photoshopped image going around around that some fact-checking agencies have had to debunk where somebody has photoshopped what looks like a bit of a band-aid or some kind of padding or plaster oh. on Chris Rock's cheek because they're trying to make out that the whole thing was staged and that Chris Rock was wearing something to basically absorb the pre-planned slap. Um, now, I, I just can't understand why anyone would have the time. Richard is leaning in in a very disconcerting way <laughs> suddenly. If you're, not li- if you're only listening to the podcast, uh, the way that Richard has just leaned into his camera, leaning over us. <laughs> you know, I, said in, <laughs> I said earlier that it was I, like... My head is as big as both of you. Yes. <laughs> this, this is wonderful. Oh, you but you're leaning in because you're exercised by something. The, yes. The, the, the other thing <laughs> is, like, people will have seen the footage then of Will Smith then celebrating the Oscar win by dancing to all of his own tunes, like without a care in the world, yeah. after he oh. slapped someone and his career might be... Welcome to Jeopardy. Miami. I just found that, that was kind of um, weird to see. I, I, I'm probably not the only person who's slightly sort of like weirded out by yeah. that. And yet, but it, it's just, a, it's an extraordinary situation. And like anything like, things like this would previously have just been put in a box of this is celebrity news, this is tat. I think that what's interesting, I think the media has moved with things, I think, like social media has done it as well, is that people see the more, the broader issue, like about, as we're sort of saying at the start there, about the use of violence and just how, how people react to, to, to awful things happening. I just think that's an interesting thing that people are examining and people do have feelings about how Will Smith reacted, how Chris Rock conducted himself, mm. how the audience and how the world and how the media and the takes industry has all reacted to it. The takes industry. 
Yeah. It, it's terrible that, that that's a thing, but it is a thing. It is isn't a thing. It? I'm going to yeah. just uh, give you two more comments because people have sent so many in and I really appreciate them doing that. Uh, Susan said he was right. She said, illness is not something to laugh at. He humiliated Will's yeah. wife. Uh, Denny says he's an idiot and should have been thrown out. You can't go around hitting people when you feel like it. And obviously, we'll give the last word to Denny on that. But um, it's a pity. I, I am looking forward to the episode of Red Table Talk, which will inevitably <laughs> yeah. ensue from this, though. It, it's it's going to have to come up. Uh, yeah. I do notice as we are wrapping up that obviously, I'd, um, Richard, I don't know whether you have a hotel room supplied plastic cup, but we're sitting here drinking our water out of plastic, uh, out of cardboard cups, rather, uh, which are going to set us back a cool 20 cents in the months oh. to come because the government has today published oh, legislation. Yes. Today, today being Wednesday night when we're recording this, um, the Circular Economy Bill, which provides for what they're calling the, of course, the single-use disposable cup levy, mm. uh, which the government itself is calling the latte levy. <laughs> uh, so the idea being that similar to uh, plastic bags back in the day where you had to pay your, t- your 12 or your 15p um, for your plastic bag, that they're now going to basically charge you 20 cent for every cardboard cup you use in the ambition of making you bring your own keep cup yeah. and, and to keep it going. And obviously the cost of living is a big issue but on, honestly I'm, I'm going to be out of house and home I have children to feed I can't <laughs> I can't afford to be playing the levy <laughs> a couple of times a day like I, they're, they're going to have me cleaned out of house and home well, let's be honest right? it's a brilliant idea brilliant idea yeah. but are any of us good enough yeah. people to be on top of this like these are brilliant incentives it's just I, it takes a certain type of you have to get into the rhythm I mm. think of actually remembering to do these things every yeah. time I go to the supermarket I'm kicking myself at the till as I have to pay for another plastic bag because I'm just yeah, so yeah because you've got like two dozen of them out in the back of the car that you didn't bring in. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I really liked about this is that when I messaged earlier on, I, I posted a tweet to say, that, you know, even the government calls this the latte levy, immediately flooded with people coming up with their own names for it. Oh. So somebody called it, you know, the flat white fee rather than the latte, because what if you don't drink latte? What, oh, the yeah, cappuccino yeah, yeah. charge? Yeah. Uh, my, my favourite one was the tea tax. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, there's what, what's all this coffee oh, culture ones are stuff? more effective. Yeah. But I just love that, you know, the, the country that brought you the stiletto in the ghetto or the, the floozy in the jacuzzi <laughs> or whatever has just now decided, you know what, the tea tax or the latte levy. Uh, I love that. If you have a better name for the latte levy, uh, do let us know. Or, of course, if you have thoughts on, on anything we've discussed or anything that you'd like us to discuss on future episodes of the podcast, do absolutely let us know. Uh, Zara, Richard and I are all on social media in different formats. I am Gav Riley everywhere. Zara is at ZaraKing.News. Richard is at News Chambers on all the mediums. What's your coffee order? What is my coffee order? My coffee order is a medium dark mocha all the time without fail. Mocha? Yeah. Oh. Mm. Richard? Weak. Um, <laughs> I, am, I am a different, different order depending on the shop that I'm in. I love Cortados wherever they have them, but they don't have many of those places in Dublin. So it's generally an Americano, to be honest. Tara, your I'm coffee an Americano order? with hot milk. Hot milk is the trick. Okay. Divine. What's, what's wrong with my medium dark mocha? It needs to be all coffee, man. <laughs> on, so on that bombshell yeah. before before we have a full falling out um, the group chat podcast yeah, but, is no more before uh, Richard has to go and feed the meter again to Stay keep it going here. from London so we'll um, <laughs> we'll let him go uh, Richard Chambers live from London grad this evening thank you we'll see you back in the flesh soon uh, Zara King thank you. thank you and thank you all for listening we will see you next week for more of the group chat bye